Welcome back to the second of the Halloween lectures for Philosophy 4, Introduction to Philosophy Knowledge. We've finished, for the time being, talking about verificationism. We talked about strong and weak verificationism and gave reasons why strong verificationism, the idea that a single discrete observation can prove a certain fact to be true and that a sentence only has meaning when there is some discrete observation that would confirm that it's true. We talked about reasons why that might not be sufficient. We talked about weak verificationism, which was the idea that maybe on Ayer's perspective, if we say, well, a sentence has meaning so long as I can go back and say, here's the observations in the world that would at least make my claim probable. If I can do that, my sentence isn't meaningless, and I should believe that it's true just in case I can observe evidence that makes it probable. The next theory we're going to talk about, and you'll be on the same outlines here, but you will be on the second half of the outline from last time, the verificationism one. The next thing we're going to talk about is falsificationism. So Karl Popper is not represented in your textbook, but historically he represents an important trend of philosophers of science who said maybe more has to be done than simply finding instances which verify your claim. And maybe instead what we should talk about is falsification. Falsification versus verification. Now in some ways the verificationist that Popper is talking about is less sophisticated than the one that Ayer talks about. So let's think about what verification looks like in sort of a simplest possible case. So the simplest case of verification is going to look something like this. I find instances of a claim to prove that a claim is true. So in other words, verificationism in the most general sense is likely to be a theory that says something like this. If you want to know if a certain claim is true, all ravens are black, for example, go in the world and see how many black ravens you can find. Each time you find a black raven, you've confirmed your hypothesis in some way. So what might this look like in the real world? So let's assume that I am going out to find black ravens. So I go out into the world and I start searching in the world for black ravens. And here's one, I found a raven and it's black. Here's another one, I found a raven and it's black. Here's another one, I found a raven and it's black. Let's say the world is full of ravens and each time I find a black raven, my theory is verified, at least to a certain degree, right? I have evidence for it. Here's a black raven that looks like it supports my theory. There's another black raven over here. Here's another one. Here's another one, and each time I find one of these black ravens, I've given some reason for thinking that my claim is true. Simple version of verificationism. The claim being, all ravens are black. How much evidence do I have for the claim all ravens are black? Well, I have quite a few cases in which I found it was, in fact, true. Even eight cases. Now, the reason Popper dislikes this form of verificationism, two reasons we'll talk about today, are as follows. One problem with this model of verificationism is that according to Popper, we can find some evidence to partially verify any general theory at all. And no amount of observation can fully verify any general theory. So let's go back to an example here. So let's 
stop talking about ravens for a second and let's talk instead about and a claim that all circles are green. So if you were to look at, this is my restricted universe here of circles. If I wanted to verify the claim that all circles are green, the easiest thing for me to do would be to say, look, I found an instance that verifies my claim. Here's a green circle. And that gives me some reason to think that all circles are green. I found one, and that verifies my claim. So that gets at Popper's first worry, which is that I can find some evidence to partially verify a new general theory. His second worry is that no amount of observation can fully verify any general theory. If we went back to something like our ravens in this example, let's assume that I started finding ravens and collecting them. Here's a black one, here's a black one, here's a black raven, and I start collecting black ravens. In this case, let's assume that I'm pulling them out of the world and pulling them into my collection. How many black ravens do I need to find from various sources and pull into my collection to be convinced that the claim all ravens are black is true? Let's say I found about 10 here. Is that proving my theory to be true? Let's say I found 20, 30, 40, 50 ravens. At what point is my general claim that ravens are black verified by my observation of ravens? Well, we know from David Hume, among others, that this is never going to be done because there could always be a raven that's hiding out here that is our white raven. We haven't pulled him into the square yet because we haven't seen him, but he could be out there even though as of yet we haven't observed the white raven. A point relative to question number one again is something like a more general theory. Let's say Freudian theory of the person, right? According to Freud, the young male develops and gets his identity by falling in love with his mother and wanting to kill his father. Eventually he finds a woman who looks like his mom and acts like his mom and he treats her like his mom and he takes the role of his father. So let's say I wanted to figure out if Freudian theory was true or not true. Is it true that every man when he's a boy, falls in love with his mom, is afraid his father is going to kill him because he loves his mom and instead ends up marrying someone less like his mom. So let's say I went out into the world and I started finding people who, for whom this is true. Now let's assume, since we're talking about Freud, that this was probably true of Freud. So if I'm Freud and Here's his beard and his smile. The easiest place for Freud to find some evidence that people fall in love with their moms and marry their dads, sorry, fall in love with their moms, want to kill their dads, end up marrying someone like their mom because they can't marry their mom, is to look at himself. So any theory can be partially verified. So verification in itself shouldn't be enough to give good evidence that a claim is true. The advantage of falsification from the point of view of Karl Popper is that falsification looks, instead of for a bunch of confirming cases that prove my claim is true, my general theory, all ravens are black, all young men want to marry their mothers, it looks for counterexamples to the case in question. So it looks for counterexamples instead of just justifying what we already believe. A second point is that unlike with verification, where no matter how many examples of black ravens I find, it doesn't prove that black ravens, that all ravens are black. If I can find one counterexample, that's enough to show that a general theory is false. 
So let's go back to something like Freud here. Freud says, ah, men fall in love with their mothers and want to kill their dads. And here's evidence from me. And realistically, Freud had some other case studies. And here's some other people who I found. And when I studied their dreams, they had dreams about big lions, which I think are examples of their dad, and um, women in them, and I think that's examples of their mother. So here's a bunch of people. I studied them all, and it proves that I'm right. How many people would Freud have to fill into this observation space to prove that all men really go through this? Interestingly, if we can find one counterexample to the theory, here's someone who doesn't do it, then we might think Freud's general claim that this is what happens to all men is falsified. Maybe a more straightforward example and a bit easier to prove would be something like the Black Ravens example, right? If you were paying attention when I was drawing the space of black ravens here, in order to falsify the theory that all ravens are black, all I really need to do is find the one white raven and say, aha, your theory that all ravens are black is false, and I've falsified it. So the purpose of science for someone like Popper is actually to create theories that can be not verified but that can be falsified. Realistically, Ayer's verificationism isn't the kind of simple verificationism that Popper is arguing against. Um, but you can see how changing the orientation from finding examples that confirm your theory to looking for the counterexamples that would disprove your theory, it leads to a very different way of thinking about falsification and verificationism and a very different way of thinking about truth and the worthiness of belief. So we talked about this example, all ravens are black. If I'm using verificationism, then I go looking for black ravens. And like we said before, this has limits, and it limits my investigation. I'm just looking for confirming cases. At least we might worry that that's true. On the other hand, no matter how long I observe and how many individual black ravens I find, I don't prove all ravens are black. What that means on a broader philosophical level is that the claim all ravens are black is never proven. No observation can ever prove that it's true. On the other hand, with falsification, I'm actively challenging my theory, so I'm not just confirming what I already believed, and I'm looking for non-black ravens in this case, the one thing that would prove my theory to be false. In this case, all I have to find is one black raven, and I've proven my theory is false. So for Popper, that's the goal of scientific inquiry and of claims we make about the world. If you want to make a claim about the world, you should, rather than look for the cases that confirm that you're right, say, what's the case that would, conf that would show that my theory itself is false, and then go out and see if the theory is falsified. If you go and you check for every case where your theory might be proven false, the places where it's most likely to be proven false, if no falsification is po ever occurs, then there's good evidence that your theory is true, as opposed to just confirming what you already thought. So let's think about this on the level of the process that a falsificationist might go through. So how do I go and prove that a claim, and especially a scientific claim here, is true? Number one. I see what the world would look like if this claim was true. In other words, I, I think about what the world would look like if the claim was true, right? If it's true that all ravens are black, then any raven in the world that I find is going to be black. If it's true that men fall prey to the edible complex and that all men want to marry their mothers and kill their fathers, then the world is going to be a certain way. We would expect the world to be such that Men always fight with their fathers, and they're always very close to their mothers, at, at the very least, we might expect. Okay? Then I see if there are observations which show that the theory is false. 
if I start studying people as a whole and I realize there are just as many men who fight with their mothers as men who fight with their fathers, then I've proven the theory to be false. And that's true regardless, as a general theory, right? That's true regardless of whether or not there are certain cases that prove my claim to be true. Now, you remember that with Ayer, he said if there are no cases that I can test in the world to prove if my theory is true, if there are no observation statements that would show that it's true or give me good reason to believe it at least, then my claim itself is meaningless. Popper is oftentimes taken as saying that, but Popper's claim is a bit more uh, minimal compared to that. Popper actually says that my theory is just unscientific, though not necessarily meaningless, if I can't verify it. Think about something like a claim in ethics, right? Ayer actually goes in this discussion that is in your textbook and says, claims about ethics actually go in and they tell something about our attitudes, so the descriptions of the attitudes that we have. But someone like Karl Popper is going to say, well, you can't make an ethical claim like murder is bad and then say that I can observe that murder is bad in the world. It's just not a scientific theory because murder is bad even if people are murdering. But for scientific claims and ordinary claims about what the world is like, it's unscientific and it might turn out that there's very little good reason to believe or not believe it if it's not inherently falsifiable. So what if we went back to our other examples? Professor Bodner is dead. We talked about ways the strong and weak verificationist might try and show that it's true. What if we were looking explicitly from a falsificationist perspective? What would the falsificationist say to try and prove that this theory is false? Well, I don't know, call me up. And if I answer the phone, your theory is false, regardless of all the other evidence. So one bit of evidence that proves that I am alive, that it's not the case that I'm dead, is worth more evidence than all of the individual ones that stack up to suggesting that I might be. What about a claim like God exists? This might be a bit harder. The verificationists the strict verificationist is going to want to say, did you see God? Really, just what did you see? The weak verificationist might say, well, what's all the evidence pointing to God's existence? The falsificationist is going to want to say something like this. What would the world be like if it was true that God exists? And is the world actually like that? So we might try to say something like, well, if a good God exists, then the world would be the kind of place where um, people are happy and things get along and everything works fine. If I think the problem of evil is a problem for philosophy, I'm going to say, wait a minute, the world isn't like that. And so that's a falsification to the claim that, that God exists. We might also say God exists is just not a falsifiable principle. If that turns out to be true, then, well, it's not scientifically analyzable or provable, but maybe it's still a meaningful statement. Right? Think about someone who, for example, takes a design argument for God's existence seriously. Someone who believes that that's true gives something like a scientific argument for God's existence and says, the world wouldn't be as well organized and harmonized and intricate and wouldn't work together so well if God didn't exist. And they might find all sorts of cases that verify that there are things that work together well. The falsificationist might come back and say, well, okay, but what about the examples of things that don't work right? And of course this gets us into an entire discussion about the philosophy of religion and um, the problem of evil versus the design argument, and that takes us beyond what we have to talk about, but that's at least a model for how it might work. So if there are not conditions, in other words, there are no possible conditions which would show my theory about the world to be false, it may not be meaningless, but at the very least, it's going to be 
an unscientific claim. All right, I think those are the most important things that I have to go over with you. Does it take more work to work out these examples? Hopefully the examples of God's existence and Professor Bodner is dead are relatively straightforward, but maybe it's worthwhile to diagram out some of those points that we made. So let's say I'm talking about God exists. For strict verificationism, it's just, did you see God, basically? Is there some observation that proves that it's true? If so, I have verification. For weak verification, then I'm going to want to say something like, um, what evidence is there making God's existence more likely? And I might point to something like order in the universe. On the other hand, if I'm trying to view this from a falsificationist perspective, in some ways this is going to be hard, right? Because it's not a general claim. But I might ask something like, what would the world look like if the claim God exists is true? And then, are there counter examples? In other words, is there evidence that speaks against God's existence? And like we said, the most commonly given bit of evidence that's listed by people who take this argument seriously is things like problems with the universe, pain, suffering, disorder. And this corresponds to the design argument and the problem of evil. If those problems interest you or the questions do, take philosophy one because that's where we talk about those things. All right, so I think this will conclude everything that I want to say about falsificationism.